We picked up my luggage, said goodbye to the Queen, who was out riding, and I just said, we've been sailed and I've got to go. She said, well, you know, call us when you're coming back. And um, set off for Portsmouth. All we were told to do was that if, if, if we saw a missile coming towards us, um, then we were to climb and let it go underneath us. I remember looking out over my right side going, I'm not going to say anything about this, but I can see that coming towards me because I don't want to worry them. I suppose that, um, that was the one moment when I got my, I've got my lifetime's worth of adrenaline rush there. And it gave me a, white, gave me, gave me a nasty little white fleck in the side of the, side of the of, um, of which only when I cut my hair can you see it. That's the ship's positions from the 3rd to the 9th of May. There's the Falklands and there's Argentina. The only way I can describe it is that if you've perhaps made a, a rather more risky overtake in a car than you would sometimes wish and you get that sort of hot flush, well, re double that, add 10, and then do it again, that's how hot and sweaty it became inside my um, immersion suit at that particular moment. You, you must have thought at some moments, God, I wonder if I'm actually going to come back from this. Did that thought cross your mind? I suppose it did every now and again, but not whilst I was actually doing the work. I just got on with it. It was just the fact that, well, if you know, if you get, if if your numbers up, then your numbers up. I was cannon fodder, basically, and I, I, there was no way that I didn't, I, I, I did not give an instruction to anybody. I was purely there to be instructed and to get on with it, and that was my job. You can't see, you can't see it on here. I've hidden it conveniently. They say sometimes when you move around, it starts dropping out. That was just a no, it shouldn't, we shouldn't, okay. shouldn't, 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 do, shouldn't move too much. You got it? And unlike yeah. the BBC, you haven't told me to sit on my hands. Is that what the BBC tells you to do? Sit on your hands? Well, particularly if you're in the radio studio. Because right. I had a pen in my hand. No, put the pen down. So they put the hand on the table and they said, no, 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 they can't touch the table because the microphone will, will yeah. judder, so you've got to put your hands on the table sat on them. It was the safest place to put them. I guess as, to start off with, many, many servicemen and women train for war, but it's actually quite unusual, really, for people to go and fight it. What was your initial reaction when you realised, I am actually going to go and fight? Well, it was unusual in the 1980s because uh, we, were, we, was, we were training for the monolithic threat of the Soviet... Union and the Warsaw Pact. And for a considerable number of years, we'd, we'd done just exercise after exercise after exercise of reinforcement of Europe, those sort of exercises. Um, when the Falklands came along, everybody was taken slightly by surprise. We were well trained, um, but not for that particular aspect of, of warfare. So we had to go through the, the, the whole process again. And I suppose that, that the day that we were told, which was I think kind of like April the 2nd, that we were, we were destined to go off to the, to, the, to the Falklands, at that stage nobody thought that we were actually going to get to the Falkland Islands to actually do anything. So the training process then took place all the way down. Uh, but since then, um, and particularly since the demise of the, of, the, of the Cold War, a lot more people in the armed services are facing operations on a daily basis, live operations on a daily basis. And you only have to look at the chests of, of the Air Force, particularly the Air Force, to see the number of medals that they've got, the sort of campaigns that they've been taking part in. Um, and quite a few of them have got gallantry medals. And the Army are beginning to get the same sort of numbers of, of, uh, of, of medals as well. And there's uh, a Sierra Leone medal um, in the pipeline. There's, I presume, a, a medal for Afghanistan going to be coming along. So, the, the, you know, we've got people doing it now um, quite frequently. But in the 80s, in the early 80s, it was, it was, it was a new thing to do. So there was, there was, there was an element of, of surprise that we were going to be called upon. But nobody thought that we were not ready to do it. And it was just a matter of, that's our job, we'll get on and do it. What was your family's reaction, though? I mean, uh, my understanding is that the Prime Minister you know, wasn't that keen on you going, presumably because of the PR question marks about, you know, it would have been very damaging to lose a royal son, and you actually had to go and persuade your parents that it was the right thing to do. Is that right? I mean, what was their general reaction anyway? I don't, well, I don't, th I don't think actually I had to go and persuade anybody. I mean, it was, it was a straightforward uh, fact that I was I was a member of one of the units that was allocated to the task. Um, 
if, if the Prime Minister thought that it wasn't a good idea, then, um, I mean, I don't know exactly what, what, was, what was said, but if, 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 that is, if that is what you're suggesting was the case, then I would have thought that, that the right and proper thing for, for the Prime Minister to do is to say, uh, should the Duke of York, or should those days, should Prince Andrew go, um, and the answer from, from here would have been quite simple. Well, of course he should go. He's a professional naval officer. There's no restriction on a member of the royal family not going to war. So, I mean, you know, that's his unit has been allocated to the task and off, off he goes. Um, it's as simple as that. I don't think there was, I don't think there was any more than, than, than a passing question. If, if Presumably your mother, like, and father, like every other set of parents, were worried. I mean... Oh, I think everybody was, I mean, all parents are worried when they're, if their offspring are, are, are destined to go and, and um, fight a real action. Um, I think in the, in the circumstances that, that uh, we find ourselves in, um, our family is used to, to, to service. So it was just a different element of that service towards the nation. So there, was, it, it, well, there wasn't that much of a reaction in, in the sense that, that uh, well, off you go. That's, that's your job. Go. Were you excited when you left? Worried? Frightened? Um, no. I mean, at the, ti at the time, I remember that, 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 that um, we, we <laughs> Chinese whispers became um, slightly to the fore in this, um, when I went, because uh, I got a message which had gone through about three or four people, which was, and by the time it got to me, when I was some distance away, um, uh, I, was in the, I was in Essex somewhere uh, on leave, and uh, the message got to me, your ship is sailing in four hours. Oh, really? Uh, right. So we hightailed it back to Windsor Castle because Easter Court was going on, so we, I was staying at Windsor, picked up my luggage, said goodbye to the Queen, who was out riding, and I just said, we've been sailed and I've got to go. She said, well, you know, call us when you're coming back. And um, set off for Portsmouth. I arrived at Portsmouth. I suppose I arrived about three and a half hours late, later after having heard the message that, that, uh, that the ship was sailing in four hours' time, thinking that I was the last man arriving. I arrived to find absolutely nothing going on in Portsmouth, thinking, well, what on earth has happened? The message was actually supposed to be passed as your ship is going to four hours' notice to sail. <laughs> so I got back to the ship and had to turn around and come all the way home again. So there was a bit of an anticlimax at that stage. And then um, there was huge excitement in the ship um, because so much activity. The, the, the feeling in the dockyard was, well, this is it for real. And things happened. Just, just like that, at the drop of, of, of a hat, things happened. I mean, everybody, and we were all storing ship. We were all queues of, of lorries, loads of stuff was arriving, and we were firing it up the gangway. So there was a huge sense of, of spirit at that stage. Then we sailed, when I remember standing on the, uh, we were in uh, Procedure Alpha, which is when all the ship's company lie on the outside of the, of, of, and we, we, we left in Procedure Alpha. and. At that stage, we thought we would well, we'd probably just go around the Isle of Wight and come back. And uh, that didn't happen. Uh, we carried on. So the next thought was, well, we'll go to the southwest approaches and we'll exercise and, and, and prepare for, 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 for something and we'll um, get the uh, media on board and do a bit of publicity and, and save a rattling. And uh, I think we did that, but then we carried on past that. So we said, oh, well, we're going to deploy us down to Gibraltar as, uh, you know, to be at the, at the front end um, and ready to go. And uh, we got to Gibraltar. We exercised for 24 hours in the Gibraltar exercise areas in the Atlantic, past Gibraltar and carried on. By which stage um, the sort of diplomatic efforts were still going on and we had a, a good deal of, of, of thought in the back of our mind that they were going to work. But uh, we set off for, for Ascension Island, and the, the instructions that we had was that, that we were to go to, uh, to Ascension Island and wait. So we prepared and we trained, and uh, uh, all the while, all our training had been using uh, drill weapons. We arrive at Ascension Island and um, stop 
so we drop anchor and everybody sort of sits around in the sun and waits to see what's going to happen next. And with only a matter of hours later, uh, we were up pick and straight on south. And it was at that moment that people realized that this had become a shooting war. And there were two, two things. First of all, it was the sailing from Ascension Island because there was nothing between Ascension Island and, and, uh, and the Falkland Islands. And the fact that from that day forth, all the drill weapons were put away and live weapons came out. And so from Ascension Island south, live weapons, people then realized that things, things, and so we went on to an advanced stage of readiness. And by that stage, we were in a routine. And by that stage, it was business. This is what we trained to do. This is our job. Therefore, we will just get on with it. And so at that stage, there was, there was no real concern. It was, it was, we'd started, and therefore, we just ramped up. And we were prepared. We were ready for it by the time we got there. But the atmosphere must have changed. You know, obviously did change. You know, Sheffield was hit. You were flying. Yeah, we were already there by then. That was, that was later on. I mean, yeah. we, we, having arrived in the Falklands, yeah. and we knew it was going to become a shooting war. The first thing that happened, of course, was the Falcon that came down. Yeah. Um, and I remember seeing, I didn't see the Falcon, but I remember seeing, I was actually flying underneath the Falcon at about 10 miles off the, off the coast. And we were told to go and loiter 10 miles off the coast. And we didn't quite know why we were there um, and what we, would, what we were actually doing there. But it was when we saw the pall of smoke, we then realized what was going on. Um, and so therefore, we, we, we knew that, that at that stage, uh, um, that the real war had started. And then we saw aircraft flying over us. And then we realized that we were there in case somebody had a problem and we were going to pick them up. You just talked me through a little bit about, um, obviously, you know, the war lasted quite a long time. You were on threat. You were th certainly extremely threatened when you were on Invincible, when you were up in the air, the conditions. In. in Invincible. Apologies, when you were in Invincible, you were <clears throat> very seriously under threat. You were, the conditions up in the sky were pretty atrocious. The flying, I'm told, was very, very difficult. Can you just talk me through what it was like? To I don't know whether it was that difficult. I mean, it was, it was, we were crewed up right from the word go. Um, so we had a crew, um, that was that, that we, we were we were trained we trained together. Um, the flying was nine times out of ten clear blue sky. Uh, it was quite windy, but in that part of the world, it, it, there's, there's 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 no um, pollution, so therefore the, the air is very clear. So you're constantly getting getting um, sort of gales going through. They're much going much much faster than they are here. So you get changes in wind very, very quickly goes up to 30, 35 knots and then goes right down to nothing um, and then goes up again. And so that the speed of the rate of change is much higher than it is here. There's a continuous sort of gentle blow here. Um, so there are differences in the way that the weather pattern works. But it was, um, there was nothing particularly odd about it um, and there was nothing particularly dingy. I don't think I remember doing it. I mean, there, wasn't, there was very little fog, for instance. I mean, it was just straightforward windy ship moving. It's quite fun trying to get back to a ship when, it, when it's moving, but you get used to it after a while. And it's, you know, that's why I joined the Navy, was the, you know, the challenge of deck landing. Did you ever feel under threat, though? Was there ever a moment where you thought, right, this is it? Uh, there were a couple of moments when I, most, of the, most of the attacks that took place I was airborne for or I was um, in an aircraft uh, on deck, on a deck alert, if you see what I mean. Um, and for Sheffield, I was either airborne or just airborne, uh, because that was when I was used as a decoy um, for Sheffield. And I, the timings of such that I don't, I still don't know now whether we had, whether we'd taken off after the attack was complete, because she was, she was out of range, if you see, and we couldn't see her. So n not seeing her was, was, um, was part of the problem, as we didn't see, was we couldn't see her, we didn't know. And so we were just sat, and, and all we were told to do was that if, if, if we saw a missile coming towards us, um, then we were to climb and let it go underneath us. Simple as that. Well, it was dead simple. You'll see it coming. I never saw one, so I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's easy to say now, but at the time, we were concentrating very hard at looking out of the window to see if we could see it coming. <laughs> W but during that period, were there a couple of occasions that you remember when you were particularly frightened or you thought, my God, this is getting very close? Um, I, I suppose that there was, one, there was one occasion when 
um, and I've, I can't remember which, which attack it was, but there was one attack when we were all, um, I was on board and we were told to take cover or was it hit the deck. Or, so we all took cover and lay down and braced ourselves for something. Um, and at that stage, I don't remember whether the, the, uh, anything about it, apart from the fact that we were given the all clear fairly quickly. Um, otherwise, all the other attacks I was airborne for. Um, and the one that, that, that I remember particularly was the attack that, that succeeded in, in hitting Atlantic Conveyor. Oh, the particular attack I remember is the is the is, is uh, later on was that was the one that I was airborne for, which was uh, the attack that succeeded in sinking or no, not sinking, hitting um, Atlantic Conveyor, and I was airborne for that, and we were it was about dusk as far as I remember, and we were we were um, on an anti-submarine patrol uh, in the screen, which is pr protecting the force from submarine attack. And there was a very real and, and, and potential submarine attack, a uh, uh, threat of attack, because they had submarines. But we, know, we had no idea where they were. So we were constantly hoping to find um, some signs of, of submarine. And, and, and to this day, I don't know whether there was a submarine in the area or not. I don't think anybody knows. Um, but that particular attack took place in the evening. We were down in the, in the screen. We had reports and we were told to climb. So we climbed, I suppose, to about 1,500, 2,000 feet to get out of the way so that there was the, 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 the because they knew it was a low level attack, um, then all the uh, anti aircraft weapons were then trained below 2,000 feet. But I remember one of the Type 21s was firing chaff. Um, and I remember the, the, my observer, who was in the back looking on the radar scope, said it was the most amazing sight. He'd got a number of contacts on the, on the, on the radar screen, and the moment that the attack started, people started firing chaff, and he said he had not a clue where anybody was, who anybody was, because all these contacts appeared on the, on, on the radar, which is exactly what it was supposed to do, to confuse the, 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 um, the incoming missile and the incoming aircraft when they tried to paint their target. But one of those shells with the, with the chaff in it, um, I suspect, uh, we just happened to get in the way of, and it went past us. I was just went into the cloud fairly close. I mean, I, I mean, it must have been further away than I imagined, but I remember seeing it on a steady bearing, and I'm, I'm sitting in the right-hand seat at the time. Um, it was my turn to sit in the right-hand seat, and I remember flying, the, I was flying at the time. I remember looking out over my right side going, I'm not going to say anything about this, but I can see that coming towards me because I don't want to worry them. And I remember turning the aircraft thinking, and I wonder if this is going to make any difference if I turn the aircraft. I remember turning the aircraft to the left, and when I saw the, 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 the glow of light coming towards me, which I assumed was, was the heat, well, I don't know, I just saw this sort of orange light coming towards me, suddenly start, its, it's bearing rate started to change and going, going in front of us. I stopped the turn, and this thing went off into the clouds. Now, it must have been, I could have been a mile away, I don't know, but I mean, it was, I suppose that, um, that was the one moment when I got my, I've got my lifetime's worth of adrenaline rush there. And it gave me a white, gave me, gave me a nasty little white fleck in the side of the, side of the, of, um, of which, only when I cut my hair can you see it. Um, and it's been there ever since then, um, but. Did you have time to be frightened at that particular incident, or did it just happen so fast, you just? No, it just happened. I mean, it was, it was, it was, you know, there was a, I mean, uh, the only way I could describe it is that if you've perhaps made a, a rather more risky overtake in a car than you would sometimes wish and you get that sort of hot flush, well, re double that, add 10, and then do it again, that's how hot and sweaty it became inside my um, immersion suit at that particular moment, but having got away, that was the sort of feeling I had. That was the sort of, you know, that's, my God, that was a bit risky. Um, but from then onwards, I mean, it was a matter of, we, we, I did one orbit at that stage, and then it became perfectly clear that Atlantic Conveyor was in difficulties. So we were, we were down there like um, weasels. To, um, and there were about, I don't know, about six or seven aircraft within five or 10 minutes, sitting over her deck, pulling people off. I mean, she, but she was burning by that stage already. I never got anybody off her. 
I was the last aircraft. We, we went into a we went into a sort of basically into a holding pattern, and they tried to fight the fire, but then realised it was so they then abandoned, and people went down over the over the starboard quarter, and forward, to the landing deck, and I was number three in that particular pattern, and by the time we got over the deck to land, it was quite obvious when we looked out that there was nobody there, there was nobody to be to be to be taken off. So we then, but then started to get, it was then getting dark. And that was when people were going into the water. And there must have been three or four helicopters sitting in the hover alongside. There was also Type 21 who was alongside trying to fight the fire as well. Um, quite a complicated arrangement with lots of floodlights trying to, f to search for people as they floated away from, from the ship. I think we picked up three. And we directed other aircraft onto a lot of others. Um, in the sense that, that we could see somebody and we'd go, there's one coming your way, you'll pick him up in about two minutes as he comes past you. And the commanding officer, I think, the, cat, the master of Atlantic Conveyor was never, was never recovered when he went over the side and, and I, nobody knows where he went. But we, I picked up a couple, maybe two, maybe three, I can't remember. That kind of thing, back. presumably, though, is uh, quite traumatic, not necessarily the time, perhaps afterwards, when you think about it, seeing down, seeing burning, sort of trying to make sure that you rescue people searching in the darkness. Yeah, but it, but um, it, 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 yes, I suppose it was. But it was part of the, it's part of what you're trained to do. Um, and the most valuable thing about um, those aspects is that when you've completed those tasks, uh, the first and most important thing you must do is to go and talk about it. And did you? Well, you've got to because that's the way to relieve that trauma. Um, and, and, and if you talk about it. Uh, and you get that sort of, of of immediacy of the situation off your chest. You can then go to sleep, and if you can go to sleep without worrying about it, you've got another thing to do. By the end of, I mean, I did 113 flying hours in the month of May alone. That's quite a lot of hours. And by the time it came round to, to, to that sort of the end of May, beginning of June, I had lost track of whether it was morning or night in the sense that, that there, was no, there was no logic behind the times. And uh, it, quite often, because the ship, of course, had no, no windows in it, you would arrive on deck and discover that what you thought was six o'clock in the morning was actually six o'clock at night, and it was dark. And that happened on at least two occasions that I got up thinking that one thing and had a meal. And, and, and I worked, eventually, about halfway through May, I worked out that the best thing to do was to have two meals a day, not bother with a third, have one in the one when you one when you got up before you flew, and one when you got back, which were basically the same, which also added to the con confusion. So you add you ate roughly every, once every twelve hours. It was the only way to do it. By this stage, a lot of people, quite a lot of people, had died. The British public had had some really big shocks. Y you must have thought at some moments, God, I wonder if I'm actually going to come back from this. Did that thought cross your mind? I suppose it did every now and again, but not whilst I was actually doing the work. It's, it's funny, when you're actually doing the work, I, I'm, I'm certainly from my perspective, I don't know about other people, but I mean, the, 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 each, each and every, every person deals with these things in a different way. But I just got on with it. It was just the fact that, well, if you, know, if you get, if, if your number's up, then your number's up. Um, in those particular days, we didn't have some of the equipment that we have now, and I'm, I wonder whether, if we'd had the equipment that we have now, would I have been better off? And the answer is no, I would have probably been more worried. We had no ability to be able to detect, in our aircraft, we had no ability to be able to detect radar. So we couldn't hear whether we were being illuminated by radar. Well, we've all got that equipment now, so you know when you're being locked up to. So you know when somebody's targeting you. What do you do when you're targeted? Well, you then have to do a certain, you do, do maneuvers. In 1982, we had no idea that anybody had locked us up. I have no idea whether we were targeted or whether we weren't by a radar, and somebody decided that we weren't a big enough target and therefore not to be. We were more at risk, I suspect, in, if we were doing a long range mission uh, from uh, our own units forgetting that we'd actually gone out of the screen and that we had to come back so that we were always 
coming back, we had to come through a specific gate in order to be able to identify us as being a friend rather than a foe. So we used to come back at a specific height and a specific point in the, on the compass. And that was the way that you got back in again. Now, we never, nobody had a blue on blue, which is what it's called. We, we, never, we never shot anybody down. Were you able to talk to your family? I'm still to your here. <laughs> <laughs> Were you able to talk to your family, to your mother during this time? No, what sort of no not, during the, not during the campaign. The campaign, it was a straightforward, I mean, there was no time. We just got on with it. Um, the first opportunity I had to um, make contact with home was about the 15th or 16th of June, I think. Um, shortly after I was, um, well, I, I, I went ashore with um, the commanding officer of my squadron. And um, I remember that was the day that I, I did an interview for the BBC. Um, when I was, I was, I passed him. Well, he passed me in the in the, in the, on the Stanley Way on the on the High Street, and said, "Oh, can I ask you a few questions?" I said, "Well, I, said, I suppose you can." And then after that, I was I went on board um, one of the Sir class and uh, used the used the uh, satellite phone for about five or ten minutes to speak to the Queen to let her know that everything was okay. Presumably, they'd been very worried, like every set of parents, as they'd seen the kind of casualties mount and. The I think that um, at the time my private secretary, who was the Queen's Aquarius at the time, remembers um, being called in the middle of the night when the Queen was away doing a particular visit. And, and there was always a nervousness about the telephone ringing at the odd hours of the day or night. Um, but I seem to remember that on this particular occasion, it was I'd, I'd asked somebody to make sure that the Queen knew that I had not been involved in a specific incident. And so the phone rang at an odd, because of course the, 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 there was a time difference, I think it was four hours, three, four hours, um, the time difference meant that something had happened and, and we needed to get a message back that it, I, it had not involved me. I can't remember what had happened, something had happened to, to one of the aircraft. Uh, and we'd wanted to get, the, somebody said, well, we must get the message back that you're not involved. So I said, fine, okay. And that phone call was made. So there was, there was I think my mother's always, always felt that the telephone ringing at a, not at a time which she, she wouldn't expect was always something to be, to be nervous of. But... It must have been a very relieved telephone conversation there when you finally made it. Well, when I spoke to her the first time, I remember the telephone exchange uh, when I, I rang through. I rang Windsor Castle because it was, it was Ask It Week. Um, and uh, I remember um, the telephone operator saying, Oh, Your Royal Highness, are you back in the country? And I thought for a couple of moments, and I thought, well, now how do I say that? So I said, well, yes, I am in a manner of speaking. <laughs> but I was back in the country, but the wrong one. I mean, I mean it was, and and um, so she said, well, I'll put you through to uh, Her Majesty. So I said, thank you very much indeed. And um, it was about the right sort of time, uh, six o'clock in the evening, I suppose. And um, the Queen happened to be walking down the stairs, and she'd heard the telephone ring, and thought, I wonder who that is. So picked up the telephone and said yes. And the telephone operator said, oh, it's, I've got Prince Andrew for you. And the Queen said, you can't have Prince Andrew. He's at sea in the Falklands. And the, and the, and the telephone operator went, oh, Your Majesty, but he says he's Prince Andrew. And the Queen said, well, I think you'd probably better put him through in that case. And um, so I said, hello. And she said, oh, it is you, she said. So I said, yes, why? Oh, well, I didn't think that you'd be able to get to a telephone. So I then had a, a very short conversation and, uh, and, uh, and said that everything was fine. And uh, I think, I come to think of it, I think, it, I think the phone call earlier in the week had been to do with um, uh, the Welsh Guards and Scalahad. I think that was something. I think it may have been what, what, what the phone call had been about, that I wasn't involved in that. Um, but I remember sending a signal back, in fact, that, that I've got to show you in a minute, um, which I sent, which the Queen received, I think, on the day, on the Monday of Ascot Week, which was, which was the, the Garter Day. And uh, on that particular day, she, there's a Waterloo dinner, and uh, she goes through the li to the library, uh, and she had the signal handed to her in the middle of dinner, and she took it with her, and she put it in the, in, in the case uh, that day, and it's been in the case ever since. In fact, it's been moved out of the case that it was in to the Falklands case. Um, but it was in the case with the signal that, 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 that the group of signals uh, that was sent by 
or the letter that was sent by Churchill um, instructing them to instructing um, th to get back Egypt and the signal that was sent back saying I have today recovered Egypt so it was in that it was in that case it's a remarkable piece of piece of and that was where the Queen put it incredible relief then from her point of view really then yeah she's quite pleased to speak to me I think and then I said I have no idea how long we're going to be here for and we were there from the middle of June through until the middle of July um, I think we left on about the 8th or 9th of July uh, and again I've got the chart that says that and we left and came back, and we were, we came back, and the Queen was there to to um, to meet us. What did she say to you in first words when you? I wish you hadn't asked that because I can't remember. <laughs> um, no, I think I think that 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 um, and she was very pleased that 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 uh, you know we were back, and I remember coming. Um, I remember coming back, and I remember being handed coming off the ship. Um, and I've got a photograph of, of, of me when I got down to the bottom of the gangway because I was the first man ashore because I was with the Queen and we then left um, to go back to the palace. And uh, I remember coming off, I remember being given the rose by the, by the man and dressed in a tailcoat with a Union flag um, waistcoat. Somebody's run out of film. <laughs> Done this before, yeah, I've done this before. Uh, so we just two or three more fine questions, and we'll be this. I was just thinking about it. <laughs> Sorry, it's probably been longer than it needs to be, but it's no, better no, no. to be longer and have everything you want than yeah. suddenly. So, um, just there are a couple of more things I want to ask you, really about your reflections looking back. Mostly. Yeah, but I, I hadn't finished with what what I was saying about coming back. Yeah, are you ready? Are you ready? Um, I remember coming down, that being being the first off with the Queen. I remember being handed the, 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 this rose by the, this chap with a tailcoat, top hat, and a union flag. I cannot think of what possessed me at that precise moment to put it in my mouth, but I did. Um, there was obviously some reason for doing that. I, I, I don't know what it was. It was just spontaneous, I suspect. But I then remember turning round to all my colleagues and friends of the ship's company who were stood on the, on the ship ready to come ashore. And I remember thinking, um, you know, it was just so wonderful. And I was, I've got a photograph of me off the ground with my hat. And the hat is in a very strange position because I would have let go of my hat once I'd got to the bottom of the gangway because I'd turn around. Um, and I remember, and the photograph's got a picture of the hat in the most extraordinary angle. And it's the, the, the moment after I w you would have let go of a hat, but I haven't let go of the hat. And the reason I haven't let go of the hat is that as I went up, I remember thinking, don't let go of your hat, which is what you want to do, because there are at least three admirals that you're going to have to say goodbye to at the end, and you're going to look a bloody fool if you don't have your hat on when you salute them to say farewell. Because I was only a sub lieutenant at the time. And uh, so I hung on to my hat, because I knew I was going to need my hat for the rest of the... Nobody else was going to need their hat, but I was. So, um, and that was it, then we got back. And then I flew the next day, came back to London, uh, back to the ship, flew in formation down to um, Caldrose, where we were, we were given a huge greeting. And the Queen very kindly sent me a, um, an aeroplane to get me to um, Scotland. And I remember arriving at, um, at Balmoral and being greeted by my elder brother at the front gate thinking, now what's going to happen? My elder brother was wearing two, three kilts. He was wearing one conventionally and two unconventionally over his shoulders, wrapped round. And I was then escorted in some barouche vehicle all the way up the drive um, to the castle and uh, arrived at the castle and was greeted in a sort of great fanfare with everybody. And, the, and um, when I arrived and got into, got, went into the front door, the Queen said, um, you can have your choice of what you'd like to eat for dinner tonight. So I said, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much indeed. I said, whatever, whatever, you must not have broccoli. And I'll never forget it. The page who was stood at the front door turned on his heel and ran. And I thought, where has he gone? About 10 minutes later, he came back. He said, I thought so. Broccoli was on the menu tonight. So I said, I've just taken it off. <laughs>
not your favourite thing then? Well, no, we, because by the time we came to the end of yeah. the time, and the, we, were, we were down to sort of the, the, the dregs of what we'd, yeah. what we'd stored on board. And, and we had a huge, long broccoli. Yeah. And it was by that stage, I don't know. No. Well, I love broccoli, but, but that particular, no. you know, by that stage, I'd, had enough. Enough bro yeah. I'd yeah. had enough of enough broccoli, broccoli for a few months. Was it very different? being a royal son fighting, or were you just one of the men? No. Um, I can genuinely say this absolutely makes no difference what your background is. The fact is, is that you're one of the people, you're one of the boys, you've actually got a job of work to do, and the fact that I had a title, I mean, anybody could have had a title, anybody could have come from anywhere, and it would have made not a halfpenny's worth of difference, because you could not, I could not have been able to have done the job unless I was professional at it. And so it makes the, 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 the fact of background makes no difference. And in fact, in some respects, it's a it's it's a it's a hindrance. But I've learnt a lot about myself at that stage, um, and it's given me a perspective on what I would describe as everyday people. My 22 years with the, with with the navy, and particularly that. I mean, there were a lot of sharp edges before I went to the Falklands. And I remember coming back thinking, you know, that some of these sharp edges have gone off and there's a bit more. And you grow and you develop as, as, as you go through life. And, and that was a huge growing up experience. And, and, I mean, there is part of me that says you should all experience what I experienced. But I would never wish it upon any of you. Because it, going to war is not something that, that, that anybody wants to, would, would, would recommend. But as a growing experience, being put in those positions and in those that that those conditions, those those positions, those uh, areas of stress, um, that it changes it changes you. Is there a specific way do you think it's changed you? I mean, the experience no, because, of fear because and for the last twenty-two, if you see what I mean, the last twenty years. I mean, I I, I just joined the navy, so I was year year and a half, two years in when I when I when I when I went to the Falklands. So that was a very early experience. I've changed again in the last 20 years the same amount I've I had probably changed in those two years. Again. And I've grown and developed and, and learnt a lot more. And you learn something new every day. So, I mean, I... Uh, but it was a very intense experience that not many people go through. No, and I'm tremendously grateful that I was... There's part of me that says I'm tremendously grateful that I actually had the opportunity to, to do it. But there's another part that says Nobody should do it. You shouldn't have to go to war. We shouldn't have to go to war. But if you have to, and that's your chosen career, then so be it. And I was tremendously privileged to have been a part of, and don't forget that I was a sub-lieutenant, which is the most junior officer, apart from midshipman, in the Navy. I was cannon fodder, basically. And I, I, there was no way that I, didn't, I, I, I did not give an instruction to anybody. I was purely there to be instructed and to get on with it. And that was my job. And so, um, if, if you see what I mean, I mean, I've taken, I, I know what it's like to take it. And so I was, I was the, I was the junior of the junior. So, you know, you just got on with it. And it was, I was very, very green and very, very wet behind the ears in, in military speaking terms. So, you know, it was a learning experience. Do you talk to your daughters about it? Funnily enough, I, I, not very much. Um, I suspect if it comes to a position where they're doing modern history at school and, and, and the Falklands comes up, then they would ask me a question. But, but I've not brought it up with them, not specifically. Every now and again, they see something that I've got that I've, and they say, where are you going? I'm going to the Falklands or I'm doing something for the Falklands. And you tell them about it. But otherwise, no. It's quite unusual though, to have a father who's had direct experience of war, though, isn't it? Not now, it isn't. Well, even so, it's still quite, I mean, the Falklands War was, you know, it was quite a brutal shooting where a lot of people died. And I know that there have been many actions since then, but it's not that often that we get involved in a war, which you know, we might have lost after all, and the casualties were quite severe. Yes. I mean, we did have a distinct advantage in the fact that we were fighting a conscript army who didn't really want to be there. Um, and they were facing some of the best trained military people in the world. I mean, they, the, in some respects, they'd taken on a bit more than they could chew. Um, even though we only sent um, a, 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 a fairly small, I mean, two brigades. 
But the, the remarkable thing about it is the fact that, first of all, I was a, I was a junior officer, but I was, a, I was a very, very, very small piece in a very large game. I mean, the, the United Kingdom deployed 27,000 men, be they Navy, Army or Air Force, 8,000 miles, and sustained them through a sea line of communication for nearly four months, which is a remarkable achievement for anybody. I mean, I mean even, even, even the, the, those people with whom we worked with in NATO and those whom since we are now friends with in the Soviet Union and, 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 and the Warsaw Pact, the former Warsaw Pact, said, we didn't think you could do it. I mean, it's a remarkable achievement. So I was only a very, very, very small cog. If I was even a cog, I was a sort of, a, I was just, a, just a, just a spoke in the, in, in, in one of the wheels of, the, 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 of you know, a huge effort. Last question, really. When you look back on the war now, what are your abiding memories or reflections upon it? Not, you know, in any sense politically, but as a human experience, the experience of war. I remember that 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 if I. The, the, the first thought was that if I was asked to do it again, I would know what to, to do, and therefore I would be more capable the second time around. Um, and in all the subsequent campaigns that, that have happened, um, I've only played a minor part in them, partly for no reason other than my ship or unit has been doing something else or not been directly involved. Um, so there's, there's always that feeling that if it ever came around again, I could do it. The other one was, was the tremendous pride in, in, in the fact that as a group of people, we achieved something that most of the world thought was not possible. Um, again, 27,000 men, 8,000 miles away, down um, a sea line of communication that's 8,000 miles long with virtually nothing in between. One island and, you know, Ascension Island, and that's it. Um, it's a remarkable achievement to, to um, have been a part of. And so that's where, 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 where I um, think. I mean, there are, there are minor incidents that, that you hear about. There are, there are moments when, um, well, I remember, I remember getting wet um, because somebody uh, we directed, uh, you know, somebody else thought he had a contact um, and directed us, no, I didn't get wet, I got somebody else wet. Um, when some, he directed us on to, to, to drop a depth charge to, to do a classification run. We used the depth charge to see if we could actually, if we could get the, the contact to move. Um, and I remember dropping one fairly close to another helicopter and I remember him calling up on the radio and saying, thank you very much indeed, we need to turn the windscreen wipers on. That was at night. So he couldn't see it, he just, he just suddenly noticed that the, the window had got all, so he turned the windscreen wipers on and had to wipe the seawater away. Came back and washed the aircraft. A lot of, I mean, a lot of humour probably in war. I imagine very tired. You've made it clear you were very, very tired a lot of the time. You couldn't tell night from day at one point. But a lot of suffering as well. Um, you, have to, you have to, you have to, you realise that, that that the navy is in a different position to the to the field forces. Those that are on the on the ground are are in a different position to those of us at sea. We we remain there longer, but we take our, as it were, living quarters with us and we live in, our, in, in where we work, whether it's peace or war. So, you know, there's, there's no real difficulty about that. The, the, the guys in the field have a different, different um, perspective. Now, I've done some field work, but not very much. And I have tremendous respect for those people who, who are actually in the field. I mean, what those, what those uh, Royal Marines faced when they yomped across was extraordinary. Um, I mean, that is, that is, that is putting yourself out. That is loyalty. Because I did, the, I did the commando course before I um, went to, to, so I knew what they did, and I remember that the, we did a thirty, we do a thirty-mile march as the final test of the of, for the for the Green Berry, and that march is designed as a one-off in your career. You should never have to do it again, but it is there to tell you or to teach you that should you ever be required, you can do it again. And those guys marched something like 40 miles with a full pack. So they knew, they already knew they could do it because it was part of their original course. 
So they knew they could do it. Um, but it's, it's, so I knew what they were going through because I'd already done it myself. And there aren't many of us who've done, done, done that particular course. I think I'm the only officer to have done Dartmouth and Limston concurrently, but that's not part of this particular. Well, thank you very much. You're very very good, sir. Are you happy? <laughs> a quiet day with depressing and gloomy weather consisting of low cloud, poor visibility and rain matching the somber moon on board as the full impact of yesterday's event sinks in. That's the sort of, there's the, that's the ship's positions from the 3rd to the 9th of May. There's the Falklands and there's Argentina. Steaming around. Um, what's this one? Now that's the programme. That looks rather depressing. Oh, here's the signal. Yes, if you have any push, the sooner the better. <laughs> that had absolutely not the slightest effect. No, I'm sure. It was the date that we, we sailed. Uh, yes, 4th of July we sailed. 1st, 11th of July? No, it was about the, about the 12th of July. I think it was. And uh, we were then told Invincible and Bristol depart at 20 hundred. I remember it. And that was it. <whistles> Home. Zero five five at 25 knots. That was the, that was, that was the way we went. Could you, would you mind just talking us through this just so that we... That, um, uh, that I sent to um, the Queen the day after the uh, surrender. Um, uh, I think it says Defence Services Secretary Buckingham Palace for Wise. Uh, Wise actually is the is the name of the man at Buckingham Palace for whom right. it was for. Info all update. At last, it is all. It is over. We now wait for confirmation that all hostilities are at an end in the South Atlantic. The weather has turned really nasty. That's what I remember. I remember the weather turning nasty at the end. But um, and we are out of limits, icing and deck, which basically means it was too cold and the deck was out of limits. Uh, so we couldn't fly. One aircraft took a wave on its hull during a dip that equals 45 foot waves. That's quite a push. And then I say, I'm relieved at the end, but saddened at the thought of all the young Argentine troops facing a questionable return to Argentina. And the reason I said that was that I was, when I walked through Stanley, I actually flew after, the, after walking through Stanley and seeing piles and piles of weapons. I remember um, flying across Stanley Airfield and thinking about that there were thousands of Argentine troops just sitting there waiting and you know what was going to happen to them and that was the last we saw of them um, and I feel pride uh, but we've paid heavily not very surprisingly with the number of we lost over 200 and then I expressed my condolences to the Colonel of the Welsh Guards which was uh, my elder brother and as I say there there is only one thing that I can say we will remember them. And that uh, was sent on the 16th of June at 0130 Zulu in the morning. And it must have arrived on the 17th, which is the Monday or Tuesday of Ascot Week, and the Queen gave it to put it into the, into the library. And that's it. Those are, those are the things that I, I, gave the, I, I, gave, I brought back, and they've stayed in the, in the library ever since.
just thinking, you know, sort of from the view of the Vietnam War, the Indian Trump and the officers sort of who shot by their men, and they've done all these studies in America recently, this guy from Harvard did a study which basically showed that the vast majority of the 